Hello everybody, here I am with uh, Kai Muga uh, from Germany, a physical medium. Uh, nice to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So, I'd just like to ask you a few questions, um, so about what you do, etc. Um, so, how long have you been doing this work? Um, under the name, or with the name Felix Circle actually, since the Felix Circle was founded and that was in the late 2003, mm -hmm. changed to, to 2004. But basically I'm holding and giving seances, bringing people together in sitter circles. I am doing this since I'm 15 years of age. That means since 1883, actually. 1983. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, very untypical for a German youngster, but uh, things uh, fell into places, and um, I uh, don't know myself exactly why that was all written into my destiny's mm. plan, but uh, it was so, obviously. Meant to be, definitely. Well, it's a beautiful work that you do. Um, so, can you explain what a table seance is? Oh, a table seance is a, a very early expression of um, um, spirit communication, actually. And when the people in the Western Hemisphere, we're talking here basically about the uh, spirit communication tradition of the Western Hemisphere, and when they started to find out how that all worked, they sat around the table. And interestingly, when people sit around the table, for example, put their hands on the table and call the spirits, then um, interestingly, uh, these uh, objects in, in the midst of those who take part become somehow animated. And these are the the rudimentary, the very early forms of exchange of energetical expression uh, within this uh, spirit communication thing. Mm. Yeah, so it is spirit communication, meanwhile sitting around the table and using the table uh, as a measure, as a measuring tool a little bit. And um, of course uh, the table can be used to um, give no and yes answers additionally. You can even implement with the table a fully alphabetical code. Let the table uh, knock once for A, knock twice for B and so forth. Very time consuming, but that's the way how with the table um, the mediums have worked. And then there is more or less a pure phenomenological way of work with the table, like the famous medium Eusebia Palladino, mm -hmm. who is a very central name within um, historical physical mediumship. She worked all her 30 years of career with a table, her clients around the table, the table in front of her. So the table is so uh, can be used uh, uh, in two different forms, in a communicational and in a phenomenological way of working with it. That's amazing, good communication tool. Definitely. Yeah. Can you explain uh, what a cabinet seance is? A cabinet seance is usually the environment when you are uh, uh, enabled or when you are um, or when you have a trained medium, usually deep trance uh, routines are then um, applied and a medium is sitting in, in the cabinet or in front of the cabinet or even uh, in, a, in a little distance from the cabinet. And um, yes, this is another setting uh, of that Western Hemisphere spirit communication tradition. And the cabinet is actually um, um, an extra space, a, 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 a secluded, is that the right word, a secluded extra contained. space, a contained yeah. extra uh, space in the room, uh, which shall be shielded against uh, all other forms of energy. So the human group sits a little bit in the distance and within the cabinet, etherical energy can be amassed. And that's the basic idea 
uh, as a psychic battery, so to speak. Okay, yeah, okay, mm. great, yeah, great terminology. Mm. Um, so what types of phenomena might people experience uh, sitting in your seances? A classical physical phenomena, mm -hmm. as we know them from mediums like uh, Rudy Schneider or Willy Schneider, um, one needs to know that we are more coming from the tradition of the experimental mediums of the European heartland, not so very much from the spiritualistic side of things, uh, which looks at things very much from a religions, a religious stance. We are more coming from an experimental background. And um, so these very basical, classical, physical phenomena like uh, object affection in a distance, um, up to materialization mm -hmm. or apportation. And um, yeah, opening the concepts and moving beyond the ideas of spiritualism, uh, the phenomena in the seance room even uh, en enhance. And so um, very unique things are being shown as well, like for example, uh, so-called spirit portals, mm -hmm. open so-called spirit portals, which is uh, untypical for classical seances, as far as I know. Yeah, so a, a wide array of phenomena up to uh, the most interesting forms of materialization imaginable. Really good. How do you go into trance and how long does it take? Um, we are using for our um, spirit communication work, for our work under the name Felix Circle, or in the work we share with people today, we are using a breathing routine. Uh, a breathing routine in, in the tradition of our main guide, Rudy Schneider, mm -hmm. who was using a breathing routine as well in the uh, times he worked. And, um, you know, uh, every, every deep trance medium is separating itself from its own bioform and to different degrees it is overgiving the own bioform. So the medium who only wants to have automatic writing is only overgiving its arm, is separating itself from its arm, is overgiving the arm uh, to the intelligences out there. Uh, meanwhile, in our full-scale physical seances, I actually do overgive my uh, own body, which I am training for so many years. These are inner processes of separating. Um, I find myself in, an, in, a, in a separate meditative room, so to speak. And this room is where you go during this trance state? This is where I go during the trance state and then the spirit, I expect, the spirit for who I make myself available, mm -hmm. so to speak, enters my body and overtakes. Great. Amazing. Um, what was that like when that first happened the first time? Was you aware of the process? Oh, that had to happen step by step. Step by step. Okay. So, so at the beginning you are, you are fully conscious more or less, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but you already have uh, undergone uh, processes in which you have in deep trance connected yourself with a spirit guide who is specifically res responsible for the speech. So you already know you are connected uh, with the in with higher forms of intelligence, let's say, uh, but you still trigger your own speech, you are still part of the speech itself, you are even still part of the thinking processes behind that speaking. Um, but the way I have learned and the way we are teaching it, very quickly, between, let's say, maybe seven and ten times, you are um, doing that, you very quickly um, 
turn that speech into an automatic process. So imagine simply that what, what, you, what we know about automatic writing, transfer that from the muscles of your arm mm. to the muscles of your uh, 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 voice box. Um, there is no big difference in automatic writing as in automatic speaking. Uh, uh, a verbal or a word related content is produced um, in automatic writing with the help of the muscles of the arm in automatic speaking with the help of the muscles of the voice box that's the only difference right what is ectoplasm ectoplasm is a central artifact of the Western Hemisphere sound form. Um, it is representing the Western Hemisphere tradition of um, manifestative spirituality, of spiritual forces manifesting uh, somehow physically. From manifesting to materialization, it's only a small step. And even though we know about materialization in many, many other traditions, uh, not before we encountered uh, the seance room, ectoplasm was widely known to us as a, as a compound, as a substance. In the meantime, we know that not only materialization, but also ectoplasm is known in other spirit communication traditions as well. Uh, even though it was of, co of course not called ectoplasm, the term ectoplasm is coming from the Nobel Prize winner Charles Richer, a uh, physicist, um, who transferred that term from microbiology uh, onto or into parapsychology. He was observing processes with the medium uh, Marc Béraud in Algier in 1903. And within the next three years, he established the term ectoplasm that is usually uh, uh, used to uh, describe cell activity under the microscope. Right. When was your first uh, experience of physical phenomena? Um, when I was just 11 turning into 12, I became witness of a very wild poltergeist disturbance case in the household of my best school friends then. And um, at that time I was already years long involved in encounters with spirits because since I am four years of age I am a natural out-of-body experiencer. Mm -hmm. That means when I was a little, little boy, I once turned around in my bed and fell out of my body. And first I had to start to become familiar with what was going on, then was um, wandering through the house where we lived, where I encountered the spirits of my parents, the spirit of my grandparents, and so forth. So uh, I already had a years-long uh, history of encounters with spiritual entities and with astral traveling. Uh, I very soon learned then that I only needed to think of locations and could quickly project myself there, something I, I had read over, over the afternoon in a journal or something like that. During my excursions, I remembered it and was there. And the next morning, I told my parents about my nightly excursions, and they tried to convince me that it all was sleep, and I was so sure and knew that it wasn't a, a, a dream. Not sleep, excuse me, that it was a dream, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then um, this poltergeist case broke loose, and I observed the massive helplessness uh, of the family. Um, you know, poltergeist energies are very much the same energies that happen in the seance room, besides 
uh, with the poltergeist, these energies are very much negatively inspired. Mm. They do not necessarily have to do with discarnate entities. Uh, we believe that the majority of cases has to do with uh, unspoken tensions within those who are present. Uh, usually these are, interestingly, adolescents. Uh, a little bit more girls than boys, between 9 and 13 years of age. Um, they trigger tensions inside, somehow into the outside world, and they then appear to us as physical phenomena, moving furniture, the electricity is um, affected, even the telephone is affected. Most strangest things happen. Of course, we have the cases in which discarnate entities seem to play a role as well. For example, when somebody just had diseased and shortly afterwards uh, such disturbances start to happen. So, why ever my case happened, fact was the family was totally helplessness. Uh, helpless uh, who experienced it and I as an outsider was ignited by what I was observing and I knew very deeply within that it very much had to do with what I was going through for years and everything shifted then towards physical manifestations of um, intelligences beyond the human being. So this that, experience triggered more things to come, basically? In, uh, in the following three years, I read everything mm. I could find. And then I was 15. Okay. Then I came on the boarding school where traditionally all the boys of my family went for many generations. And on that boarding school, I founded my first experimental circle. Fifteen. That lasted for two years. Right. The whole two years I was there. Very, very early. It was just a few weeks I was on that boarding school. And I had other school comrades ignited for my idea mm. uh, to form such an experimental um, seance circle for... Uh, manifestations and phenomena and wonder and parapsychology and so forth. Um, and we met every Tuesday in the House of the Girls. At that Tuesday, the teachers had their sports evening yeah. and we could summon the spirits. And all my circles, and there followed quite a lot of circles in the following years until 2004, the Felix Circle was uh, found it. Every circle had physical phenomena, very, very naturally, more or less from the beginning. Right. In the many different settings we were doing that. And all positive and everything. Yeah. Always only positive. And, um, yeah, n negative experimental sittings are more or less not known in the literature. Mm. You don't find anything about it. Mm, in the uh, 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 in Hollywood films you, f you find yeah, that with the Ouija board and <laughs> so forth. The problem with the Ouija board comes f from the fact that mainly Hasbro did sell Ouija boards for kids between yeah. four and six years. I saw this. Yeah, yes. very worrying. Yes. Mm. And of course their accidents happened. Yes. Are they still making those? It's still, of course. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, uh, interestingly uh, still massively advertised. And there is a you know, Ouija board for boys, Ouija board for girls. There, there are uh, even uh, Ouija, little uh, pink uh, Ouija board suitcases. Oh, really? That you can take your Ouija board to your friends to introduce them to the technique to communicate with spirits as well. I don't know where that, who that idea had, but that's of course very questionable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, but moreover, what we hear about 
possessions and milder forms of possessions. Um, this is not coming from the work in the seance room. Mm. The people who suffer under these conditions, uh, many of them actually were on a path of spiritual revelation, of spiritual unfoldment of themselves. But in the chronicles of the seance room, uh, we don't find any connection here. The people who suffer under this have very usually a very complex entanglement, usually family related, maybe karma related, coming over many generations. And um, it is very, very individual every time um, you have to work it out with them. But in the sales room, usually these dangers do not lurk as long as you uh, 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 as long as you are um, knowledgeable about what you are doing. And this is, of course, something we would very much recommend here. Yeah, and, and saying that, um, so what makes a good sitter? Like, what's the good qualities that a good sitter should have, basically? Mm, a good sitter should, uh, sh should be knowledgeable. He should know what, what he is in. Um, he should know that he, he is in um, a ceremonial environment in which spirits are being called. Um, it is a tradition that uh, is as old as mankind. Uh, all the societies, the indigenous, the shamanistic societies have um, been uh, in that ceremonial environment and had their own ceremonial spaces and rituals and um, that it can be very powerful and um, um, yeah you should be prepared and you should be open you should be willing uh, you should uh, not be judgy um, and uh, yeah I believe this is uh, the the main things that makes out a good sitter yeah definitely agree why are senses in dark conditions? Um, the supernatural has a very, very strong connection with darkness. When we look, for example, uh, the, the poltergeist itself, it is usually throwing the families out of the beds and the people go to bed, the knockings start. When we look at the ghost's hour, it's in the midst of the night. When we look at the sukubi and inkubi, when did they sit on the chests? At night they were sitting on the chests of the people. Justinius Kerner, who was a scholar of Paracelsus, he called that whole area of phenomena the night side of nature. When we translate the word occult, which is the latest word, the, the oldest word, coming from Greek and Latin. When we uh, translate it correctly, it is saying that what comes from darkness. So the so supernatural has uh, evidentially a strong connection with darkness. When I want to proactively come in contact with th these forces, then of course I provide an environment which is familiar and natural mm. for these entities. So when I want to keep fishes in my home, I put water in the aquarium mm. and not acid, let's say. Yeah. And that's exactly the fact, the case or the reason why darkness is needed. You can develop out of the darkness into the light to a certain degree Mm, but um, darkness, I believe, will always stay a necessary and important tool of spirit communication um, if it is about manifestations. And why is red light important to be used rather than yeah. white? Red light is a light of a lowest vibration. Mm -hmm. So, meanwhile, blue light has a very hefty up and down waveform 
Red light has a smooth waveform and when we think about that light might affect spiritual presences, spiritual presences that want to take forms of manifestation, then this lower swinging red light is obviously more convenient and more manageable for them as any other form of light. Can anyone become a medium? I believe so very much, yeah. yes. Because this archetypical form of communication, from the start on, the human being was confronted with the fact that there was seemingly an unseen world manifesting around it, around the human being. And very early, the proactive forms of trying to communicate to that supernatural realm was happening. So I believe in the end, uh, we are all, we all have that ancient archetypical form of communication, this ancient tradition written in our DNA, so to speak, over thousands of years. Human beings were doing that. As I said, the word archetypical is not false. Some anthropologists even believe that already in the Neanderthal, um, the early human being already had their rituals and, and uh, um, ceremonies to uh, get in contact with the spirit world. So, but then it would, of course, be good um, that best would be the, when you very early start with it and that your life is not full with um, basically um, things that uh, totally um, take all your time, take all your power. Mm. So we recommend, of course, an early introduction into that work. Um, exceptions are always thinkable. A, a medium out of our school uh, just turned into a powerful ectoplasmic medium um, in an age um, around 60. So exceptions um, are th thinkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are reports and where do your reports come from? Apports are um, a subform of materialization, and apports uh, are called apports, respectively. Apports are separated from uh, materializations because they are allegedly coming from a space time, or from, from a space and time uh, here on Earth um, that means they have undergone something like a paranormal transport through space and or time mm -hmm. um, and we have experienced very different and peculiar parts um, because uh, we do not necessarily know where, where they are coming from but they are so obvious um, objects that have belonged to somebody. Um, we have antique rings or things like that. Then we have very specialized apports, like for example, possessions mm -hmm. f that once belonged to the deceased right. and are overgiven to relatives in the seance room. Or handwritten messages to sitters. Uh, we have um, different expertises made of the handwritings that appeared in our wax balls, which mainly appeared in the first years uh, very, very much often. Wax balls that simply fell from the ceiling containing handwritten messages from the deceased. And these, are, these appeared in wax? 
in wax, exactly, okay. wax balls in different sizes fell from the ceiling mm. and had objects and messages in them. Very complex messages and coincidentally connected uh, objects having a strong meaning for the receivers. Um, yeah, and this is basically it. <laughs> very beautiful isn't it when uh, I guess a sitter comes and experiences that and has that connection and restores faith or a lost connection that's uh, you know it's, a, it's an amazing you know experience that someone can have basically definitely yeah. even though you know that um, we are operating a, a little bit outside of that survivalistic notion uh, we value it and we honor it and the spirits of the deceased turn up in our seances uh, but we reject the notion that spirituality is only turning about the question uh, will I survive and will my ego survive we believe there are issues to discuss with higher intelligences that uh, could be uh, of a more global benefit than of that pure uh, ego central or egoistical benefit to know uh, if my personality will survive and so forth, how my afterlife may look like. This is interesting, of course, but we believe more global, more urgent global questions concerning the survival of the species, the survival of the planet. What can be done uh, to rescue the planet, to rescue the species? What can these intelligences maybe add? What can they do to motivate us to um, bring forward the paradigm shift and such things? Definitely. Which brings to the final question for you. So what is your wish for the future? Ooh, oh, I have, I have a lot of wishes for humanity or, for the future. Yeah, um, yeah uh, my wish for the future is, is of course, that uh, we overcome this conflict-related life in which every deed, every activity of us uh, actually uh, can be discerned between a creational uh, attitude or a, or a more destructive or uh, let's say exploitable attitude, how we deal with the environment, how we deal with, with other people. Uh, I can support you, I can exploit you mm. and um, I would like to see in the future that um, these massive values which are given to us human beings uh, due uh, to the dignity of our birth being born out of that attitude we are calling love which is a powerful frequency of the soul actually a communicational frequency as well a behavioristical frequency as well um, that all the ethical and moral implications which are available for us human beings here, that they become activated by as many as possible, as many as thinkable, and that maybe with this, this planet and this species still uh, have a chance. Great, good answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank you're for your welcome. Time and your